Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and welcome. I'm very pleased to be joined by Raul Martin. Raul is the head of offshore wind and new technologies at Greenalia. Greenalia are a developer of, of projects right across the spectrum of, of energy transition from, from biomass to, to wind to solar. Uh, headquarters are in, in Spain and they have an installed um, base of six, six gigawatts and are currently working on one gigawatts of, of projects. So welcome, Raul. Thanks for joining me. Thank you very much for the invitation, Nadim. I'm yeah. pleased to be here. Yeah. So you're, you're also going to be speaking at the World Hydrogen and Renewables Iberia Conference, which is sort of 12 to the 14th of September. Um, obviously, seeing your background, you're, you're clearly the head of offshore wind. So um, you have a, a strong background in, in, in that sector, um, but also looking at, at new technologies and some of the interesting uh, opportunities that are opening up with, with renewables. And, and obviously, hydrogen is, is a part of that. So maybe could you give us a, a, just a background to, to, to your own journey um, and what you're doing uh, there at Greenalia? Absolutely. Uh, as you said, I'm, I'm the head of offshore wind and new technologies. By new technologies, everyone should understand that we are very focused in, in hydrogen. That's our main purpose within the, the new technologies business line. And on top of that, my, my background is, is an engineer, a civil and mechanical engineer from the, from the US, West Virginia University Institute of Technology. And then uh, a short uh, tenure at, at Deme Offshore, the Belgium marine contractor, who is focused more, mostly in bottom fix uh, offshore wind. Mm -hmm. And I'm currently leading the efforts in, in offshore wind in, in, at Grinalia. We are very focused in, in, the, Sp in the Spanish and, and Portuguese market. So pretty much the Iberian Peninsula plus the Canary Islands and, uh, and the Baleara Islands. Um, and then on top of that, leading also the efforts in, into the hydrogen. We have recently presented the Breogram project together with our colleagues from P2X. The, those are the German uh, leaders in this kind of like P12 um, industry. Uh, and the project Breogram will combine the efforts and, and the asset that we have, the biomass power plant located here in, in Curtis in Galicia. Mm -hmm. Northwest of Spain, uh, combine that biogenic CO2 with green hydrogen from our own assets, onshore wind and solar PV, together with um, state-of-the-art technology, uh, we would be able to produce ESAF, e-fuel, e-kerosene for the aviation industry, mm -hmm. which will help to decarbonize the, the system and, and, you know, to fight together for climate change. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, you have a, a full suite of, of technologies, I guess, ready, ready to ready to deploy with the with one hand renewable electricity and the other hand biogenic CO2, which is which is very useful and, and, and obviously going to be, a, a, I guess, a commodity under under quite sharp demand. Were you, were you pleased to see the recent refuel EU um, legislation go through to, to, to give an actual compliance market for that for that e-fuel? Yes, uh, we are currently studying it. We know that you know it has been approved, or it will be approved within mm. a couple of weeks. Um, and you know, uh, uh, we see that that is very good to have solid foundations uh, to work upon. That right now everyone understands what is green hydrogen, what is pink hydrogen, grey hydrogen, blue hydrogen. Uh, that's super helpful for everyone to to understand. Um, and. You know, being completely frank, uh, we need to, to further study the um, timely correlation, the hourly correlation as from 2030, mm -hmm. uh, because we understand that that would come with an uh, oversize of assets in wind and solar PV mainly in order to guarantee that your electrolyzer is working as many hours as possible. We were advocating for any other type of um, time correlation, to say that way, we understand that annual could not be the selected one because of the harm that it would create in the environment. Mm -hmm. But we also think that there are possibilities within the annual and the hourly. Yeah. And on top of that, the geographic correlation and the additionality makes completely sense for us. Yeah. Other than that, um, looking also uh, from the distance, but also to the regulation that the US uh, is soon to release. We have seen the drafts. We have seen the public statements, uh, but, you know, we are kindly waiting for the final version of the of the framework and the regulation that the U.S. would have in terms of hydrogen. And maybe go, going to your other hat, the, the offshore wind industry, we've seen a lot of noise and, and, and the developments, I guess, still very much the early days of, of the of the floating wind. Can you give us some, some, some of your thoughts around that market and how you're seeing it develop specifically with, with, with Spain and Portugal? 
um, how, how does the technology work? Where does it currently sit in its TRL levels? And, and what, what, what do you think the yep. um, the growth prospects are for those markets in terms of, I guess, gigawatts over the next decade? Yeah, absolutely. Um, both uh, Spain and Portugal, they quickly acknowledged that they would have to go for floating wind, meaning that they cannot be a pure bottom fix country. They cannot also be a mix between bottom fix and floating. Uh, both Spain and Portugal, because of the continental self, they would have to go for floating wind. And that's something that they acknowledge. And that's most likely the reason why we barely have any megawatts in the water already. Uh, Portugal has a, a wind float Atlantic, which is a, a very nice pilot project that has demonstrated uh, the feasibility of, of the concept, uh, in this case, from principal power. Spain, on the other hand, does not have any floater that is not a scale unit or a test unit. Um, but both countries are working towards uh, the goal that they set. In the case of Portugal, uh, it's more ambitious because they are looking for up to 10 gigawatts of uh, offshore wind by 2030, whereby Spain is a bit more pessimistic and is thinking about one to three gigawatts of offshore wind uh, before 2030. Mm. What is in the road for both countries is to establish a, a legal framework, uh, kind of like a playbook that all the developers know what are the rules that they need to, to comply with. And then they need to release a calendar for public auctions. And those public auctions would grant the, the awardee developers uh, seabed rights, uh, a point of connection, a grid mm -hmm. connection, basically, and also the rights to develop an offshore wind farm, in this case, a floating offshore wind farm. Yeah. And the, what, what is the scale of each individual sort of project? The, um, yeah, what, what, what's, I guess, the smallest project you can do offshore wind has to, has to obviously be at some large scale, no? Well, there are discrepancies amongst the developers. Uh, there are some companies that they advocate for bigger projects just mm -hmm. to reach economies of scale. But we must be careful in the sense that we are not talking about bottom fix and industry that has been established 15 years ago and that has proven that both monopiles and jackets are very suitable and the fabricators can fabricate uh, those kind of components very fast and very quick and very mm -hmm. reliable. We are talking about floaters that they have complex shapes and that you know we have not tested them and we have not reached um, a serious production yet. Mm -hmm. uh, meaning that uh, we are not in the car factory mode yet. Yeah. Um, and that means that um, we must be careful with the size that we try to accomplish uh, because it would be very unrealistic that any factory would be able to fabricate more than 20 units per year. Mm -hmm. And 20 units with the size of uh, offshore wind uh, turbines that we have at the moment is 300 megas. Uh, so particularly at Grinalia, we think that anything that is bigger than 200, 250 megas is not going to be feasible today. Yeah. We acknowledge that 10 years from today, if we have this chat, Nadim, we will be talking about projects of 800 megas, 1 giga, 1.2 gigas, and, and we would be very happy because that means that the industry has established and mm -hmm. every player in the supply chain has played a role mm -hmm. and they are confident that they can deliver. Yeah. But for the time being, we need to, to walk before we run. Yeah. And that means that projects must be commercially feasible, absolutely, but we cannot have a project of 50 units because that at the moment is impossible to fabricate within at least two seasons. Yeah. And the, for, if I'm reading you right, what you're saying, there's also scope for innovation and for the industry to, I guess, um, trial by doing and, and, and actually end up with a solution which is, is coherent because as, as I understand from what you said before we started recording there are currently two systems for for the moorage with sort of direct vertical um, moorage ropes and then others that, that are at angles um, and as we've seen I guess in other industries and in, say in in in, um, in solar back in the day there were there were lots of different configurations um for the uh, trackers and, and then the industry tended to coalesce around the, the single axis tracker and, and you see that happening in in floating wind as well when, when the industry will go to sort of one solution which actually proves itself to to be the the least cost uh and most uh secure or, or easy to maintain a solution is that is that sort of general pathway yes i mean um 
for floaters, we have kind of like three different types of configuration, right? The first mm -hmm. one is tension left platform is the one that you were describing as completely vertical ropes, vertical yeah. mooring line, that they are under tension and that's how they keep the floater in place. Then we have the semi sub or barge that is basically uh, an a structure that is in very different configurations. We have rounded, uh, circular, uh, more uh, square shape. Uh, and those, they have the mooring kind of like um, in an angle, to say yeah. that way. And then we have the spar, that the spar would be uh, suitable for deeper waters. And they are kind of like um, like a bottle, if you allow me to use the, mm. the, the comparison, right? Or a cylinder that because of buoyancy, it floats, but it mm. also has some mooring lines, right? And within each one of those three different technologies, I truly think that these three technologies would survive in time. Okay. But at the moment, we might have, and I don't know, I'm just giving you the ballpark figure, but we could have more than 15 different concepts for each one of those three different types. Uh, so in total, there is the more than 30 different floaters that mm. they have been tested or tank test or a scale model or uh, you know computer modeling, any kind of uh, test prior to commercialization. What I truly think is that eventually, a decade from today, there would be one or two uh, tensile left platforms, one or two semi subs, mm -hmm. and one or two spar. Ah, That's okay. what I truly think that is going to happen. So yeah. uh, today we are in the phase of being innovative. Uh, designers are designing themselves, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they are doing a very good job because they are taking what the market knows and trying to evolve try to think outside of the box, try to reduce cost, reduce steel or concrete, make it more um, corner shape instead of uh, rounded shape because that's easier to fabricate. All those items, um, that's what the design firms are working towards. But I truly think that at the end, uh, there cannot be 30 winners. Yeah. Uh, there would be a handful of winners within these three technologies. Yeah. Excellent, fascinating stuff. So. We look forward to, to hearing more, uh, certainly an area I, I know very little about, I've been tracking a lot on, on the floating wind. In, 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 the, in, the, in the hydrogen space, have you, you've just obviously announced this, this partnership with, with um, P, P2X um, and you're going to be looking at, is, is there some timelines there? Have you got sort of a, a, a trial project or what, what, what's the actual scope of your activities there? And have you got some timelines for developing that business? Yeah, uh, so the Breogam project, that's how we name this collaboration between P2X Europe and, and Greenalia. Uh, if everything goes according to plan, uh, it should be ready in the first half of 27. Um, our plan is to uh, produce more than 11,000 uh, tons of H2, uh -huh. which would equal to 20,000 uh, tons of e-fuel or liquid sink crude that then can be refined into e-fuel for aviation. Uh, that's what we call phase one. Yeah. And that would use uh, around, give or take, 70,000 tons of CO2 that mm -hmm. uh, is produced by our own biomass plant. Um, and that would be phase one. And, and if everything goes according to plan, for sure that there would be uh, further phases or further uses for that CO2 that uh, right now we are producing at the boiler of the biomass plant. Yeah. Excellent. Well, it's it's amazing. You, you you're doing a lot of a lot of innovative stuff there in Green Alia, and we wish you wish you all the success in, in in developing these these technologies and these new products. Um, and we look forward to to, to, to hearing more and seeing you um speaking at, at the World Hydrogen Iberia Conference um come come September. So many thanks, Raúl. Thank you for for the interview, and looking forward not to see only you but uh, the rest of the attendees in Madrid. Uh... 12th to 14th of September. Yeah, excellent. Cheers. Take care.